Well, Brian, thanks for thanks for taking the time to come on the podcast. Really appreciate you carving out uh, a, a little bit of time in this busy season. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I say it's a busy season. It is September, and we are in the middle of Christmas and holiday and sort of year-end campaigns, but many organizations don't actually start thinking about this until like mid-October. Um, uh, and, and then they kind of scurry and hurry to get it done. So hopefully this podcast, this show is a bit of an encouragement for them, a bit of a push to start on this now. It's not too late to pull this off. And we're talking about gift catalogs or, or gift giving guides, depending on, <laughs> on where you live. Um, we're going to go through three key lessons. So these are three things every nonprofit needs to know when, when crafting their gift catalog. And before we get into that, why should a nonprofit consider having a gift catalog in the first place? Well, you know, Mike, I think one of the things that that I found out through going through this process personally is that it it really allows you to demonstrate the breadth and depth of what your organization does, um, you know, in their community, whether it be locally or internationally. Um, and, it, and it gives you an opportunity to tell the stories of these different types of involvements to donors that you're probably not going to get a chance to do in just an email or just a simple one-off direct mail appeal. Right. Okay. So, so you've got an opportunity to tell a bit of a larger story, um, but for people who are who are not familiar with um, with gift catalogs or the way they work, um, are we buying gifts for loved ones to the catalog? Are we buying it for ourselves? What's generally the purpose, and and how are these generally structured to work? You know, so that's the really cool part about it is that it, it it's a little bit of all of the above. Um, you know, just through through my work, you know, through my time at World Vision or when I was consulting with other clients, we did quite a bit of research on who was buying and what were they buying for. And, you know, obviously around um, around the holidays, you know, you do see quite a bit of gift giving happening. Um, but then we also started digging in further and found out that donors were just using it as a way to contribute to their year end giving. Um, if there were parents with children you know, it, it, they would actually sit down with that print catalog and, you know, and use it as a, as an opportunity to start demonstrating philanthropy to their kids. Um, but then, you know, when we started looking at giving that came in, not around the holidays, we found out people were using it for wedding registries, uh, classroom projects, um, you know, birthdays, you name it. Um, gotcha. so yeah. So while the majority of the giving, you know, it's still going to come in around the holidays, um, you know, I always try to tell people, it's like, this really is a year round program, uh, you know, and you build it over time. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, but it's, it's not just for, you know, October, November, December. Gotcha. So are donors, are people hanging on to the catalog and just like keeping it or are organizations sort of repurposing it every quarter and, and, you know, changing the offers to match the season or, 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 or whatever's going on in the world at that time? You know, you know, that's, um, I would say a lot of, a lot of that is based off a of budget. You know, I've had some clients who do print one catalog, you know, and they will, you know, and that's the one that they have for the season. Um, others of them will generally do like two, they'll do like one for the fall, you know, the holiday season. Um, and then they're going to do another one around the springtime, usually around Easter, you know, or even just like a springtime if, you know, they're a non-denominational or non-religious client. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and the cool part about that too, is if you, you know, I, I, I learned a lot of what I know about catalogs from looking at, you know, re for-profit retailers, it's that you don't have to change the whole thing. You know, it's really the cover, the inside spread, something like that, you know, and suddenly you have something that looks and feels completely different. Um, yeah. but you know, you don't have to, re you don't have to start from scratch each time. If you do, you're, you're doing way too much work. Right. I don't know if you've had a chance to see the Amazon one, the, the print catalog that they've been doing in the last two or three years. Um, but it's it's amazing. I mean, they change it up a little bit, but it's just very well done. Uh, and it's given us lots of ideas here. Well, yeah. And, and that's um, it's funny you bring that up. You know, I'm, I'm out in Seattle, Washington, the land of Amazon. So I, I mm -hmm. think we were, you know, one of the first to get that. And um, I would say, you know, if uh, so it, one, one of the things that I saw when I, when I saw that printing catalog that I thought is like, okay, you know, here, if one of the largest online retailers is doing a print catalog, what does that tell you? Um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of uh, clients say, oh, we're just going to eliminate the print catalog. And it's like, well, you know, although the majority of revenue still comes in online, 
I really try to discourage people from just going online only because, you know, it, when we've had, don't, when we had clients do that, you know, or even just do like a test panel, we've always found out that it depresses response when you take that print catalog out of it. Right. Yeah. So if somebody's listening to this and maybe, maybe they've never run a gift catalog and they're listening to this and they're worried, you know what, our year end campaign or holiday campaign, it works really well. Um, are you suggesting that we add a gift catalog on top of that? Does this replace the year-end campaign? And if we're adding it, are, are, are we at risk of cannibalizing sort of the year-end thing we've got going on right now? No, that, that's a great question. And I would say it's definitely an add-on. You know, if, if you got something that's working, um, you, know, don't, uh, you know, don't mess with it. But, you know, what, what I found just through research across a couple clients is that it it really isn't substitutional giving. It's actually a way to get an additional share of wallet from a donor. Um, and it's one of those things that donors don't feel like it's an ask, you know, when you send it to them, because if you're doing it right, if you take the cues from retail, it's a shopping experience. Um, you know, they're not going to get any, Oh, they're asking me for money again. If, if you go into the catalog thinking that you're, you're automatically going in with the wrong mindset. It's like, I am giving you an opportunity to share all these great things that we're doing and asking you to be a part of it. And when you get into that mindset, you know, it, it just, it completely opens up, you know, the flexibility of what you can do in your, you know, in your year end campaign. Yeah. I'm, I'm serving you with gift ideas, right? It's so hard to buy gifts nowadays because we all have it all. Like, let's be mm -hmm. honest, like anybody with an Amazon account, we're so used to just, if we need something, we go out and we get it. Um, and so it's become harder and harder. Um, it's totally first world problem. It's become harder and harder to, to give a meaningful gift to somebody. So this is a way that that you as a nonprofit can actually serve your donors by by giving them a way to make a meaningful gift that has purpose and matters. And it actually solves a bit of a problem for them, right? Yep. Yeah. And, and it also, it, it's one of those things that I think um, more and more donors like it because it puts them a little bit more in control. You know, uh, whether it be their donation experience or, you know, we, there's all these, you know, donor advised funds, other things that are happening. But when you get this plethora of offers, you know, for whatever reason that you might be interested in something, um, you know, it, it it lets them make that choice and say, this is where I want my my money to go. Um, and, you know, and, and they're going to feel good about it. And, you know, for you as an organization, it's like you sometimes can learn things, you know, I, I, I you know. A little bit of uh, insider info, but you know, my time at World Vision, it's like some of the direct mail appeals came out of good gift catalog offers, so it can go the other way too. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, you're giving the donor autonomy, and and it's also a bit of a, a bit of a giant test panel for you to see which offers donors actually engage with. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say we're going to attempt a gift catalog. Uh, you've sold us. Um, there's a bit of a commitment that is necessary here, right? Uh, you already touched on this a little bit, um, but for it to be successful, this has to be a program that you run. It can't just be uh, a campaign. It can't just be something mm -hmm. that you that you're gonna that you're just gonna kind of do off the side of your desk. There's got to be a bit of a commitment here, right? Talk talk mm -hmm. to us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's like you know, you know, if, if you want to have that you know, that shopping experience, quote unquote, you know, you that it really comes down to having good offers. And that's usually the thing where everyone kind of panics and says, oh my gosh, how are we going to come up with 20 or 30 offers? Right. And, you know, the reality of the situation is if, you know, if you sit down and, you know, and you, you know, I'll, I'll use two quick examples. It's like, you know, an international relief organization, it's like, usually they're going to be doing programs around health and wellness. They might be doing something around emergency feeding. They might be doing something around education water. Okay. Well, there's five categories right there, you know, that we just talked about. If you're a rescue mission, you know, it's like everyone knows about rescue missions and providing meals. It's like, well, what about all the other things that you're doing right now on providing emergency shelter, uh, providing long-term recovery, providing job training, uh, you know, uh, bus passes, you know, transportation, whatever these things that are going on. So, you know, once you start looking at it in that mindset, you know, about what you do, and who you know and how you do it it becomes very easy um and i often encourage you know it's, it, it's kind of one of those rare situations where you get your marketing people and your finance and program people all in a room together <laughs> you know and sit and talk about what you actually do as an organization right 
the the catalog itself for for what what donor segment do they work the best? Like, is this more of a general donor or or, or mass donor um, sort of uh, product? Um, it does it work for mid level donors. Are, are we including major donors? Um, is this a good acquisition piece? Uh, how like if we do all this work to create it, how are we going to use it? Yeah. So so generally, I would say it is a a a higher end mass marketing and app. And what I mean by higher end is, you know, if you have someone who's given a gift of probably, I'm going to use a very broad statement, 50 to $75 in a one-time gift, you know, um, that's a generally a good starting point. But um, little known fact, you know, when I was at World Vision several years ago, it's like the catalog actually came out of a major donor program. Okay. Um, and it was designed by major donor reps to actually showcase all the offers for year end giving. So, it really can be a you know anything from a mass donor to a mid to a major, um, and that's one of the things that we talk about with product strategy is we say you know what's your stretch goal item you know that you have it's like is it a is it a thousand dollar gift is it a hundred thousand dollar gift is it a million dollar gift and people go oh man well hardly anybody's going to buy that it's like well sometimes it only takes one person yeah <laughs> and if you don't ask you don't get. That's so, right. you know, put it out there and you'll be surprised, um, you know, who's who might actually bite, you know, and and elevate a donor's giving by giving them that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. I, I never made the connection between. So for cases for support for for major donors, we always include like essentially what are, what are called gift pyramids, where, mm -hmm. where there, there's a very, very sort of high gift that's often you know out of reach for most donors and then it goes down all the way to very accessible offers yes um, but the donor looks at the pyramid and they they kind of slot themselves in on, of, of where they can get involved um and, and they do that's a similar psychology to what you're talking about here with the catalog um so th th that's interesting that it came out of a major gift program yes yeah, yeah. and and also too uh, you know i would say that we We've, I've also seen this happen that the catalog is, you know, it, it's something that it can be a sort of a corporate strategy sometimes too, um, because sometimes corporations will use it or businesses as something, you know, to make like a, a stretch gift or, you know, like the employees right. might get together and do this. I, I, I will say, you know, some people, I'm not saying like go create a corporate version of the catalog, but you'll be surprised to find out if you start looking at where some of these big gifts are coming from and start digging in. It's like yeah. it, can, it can be a corporate philanthropy tool as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's not a lot of work to call up a few corporate partners and just be like, hey, we've got this catalog. Is this something that you think would be useful for you to engage some of your employees? I know you do yep. employee giving anyways. I know at Christmas you guys have a party and you like, would you, you want to use a catalog? Is that a tool that would be helpful for you in order to internally sell this program? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So we're going to go through three lessons that every nonprofit can learn when creating uh, a gift catalog, uh, a gift guide. And number one is when crafting the gift catalog is to not treat it like a direct mail appeal. What do you mean by that? You know, one, one of the first things that um, I've often done when I've, you know, usually if I'm working with a client that has a catalog that's already in existence is they're like, Oh, we take the catalog and we stick it in an envelope. And you know, if and you step back and look and go, well, how many times do you get a retail catalog that's actually in an envelope or it right. might be poly bag and have an insert in it, but you know, it's, it's, it's on its own because you want it just to, you know, you want that beautiful cover photo that you agonized over, right. <laughs> you know, to just, you know, uh, to just be right there, you know, for them. And, and so, you know, generally that can be, you know, one of the first, first things that we look at, okay. um, and then the second thing is too, is just, you know, really taking it from cues from the retail strategy. It's like, you know, is it a cart? You know, it's not a donate button. It's a cart. Like what type of language are you using? You know, um, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's the shop now, not give now. Right. Kind of a thing. Um, those types of terms that, you know, that, that start all the way from like, how does it get into your mailbox to, okay, now they're going on to your online experience. You know, do they feel like they're able to browse, you know, and actually and a buy, you know, multiple items, you know, we don't want them to just do one. Right. You know, it's like if, if, you know, generally it's like a, you know, the average purchase or we, you know, the average items per card is anywhere between like 1.6 and 2.7, depending on the organization. So if you're just getting one gift, you're, you're missing out. 
Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna not put it in an envelope. Um, are, are we polybagging it, um, or or are we just like putting it in the mail like a magazine might come, um, just on I, its I own, would... and and the address is lasered on in the back. Generally, that's the best format. You know, it's like it's it, and, and I and I would say too. You know, you do want something with multiple pages. Um, you know, that has you know, so, like sometimes you know, I would say you know, ideally you'd be like eight pages and probably be, you know a minimum that you know it's going to feel like it has something. It'll feel like a hefty newsletter. And yes, if you can just get it in the mail, you know, yeah. um, and and really work with your vendors and say like, okay, what's the size and the format that doesn't have to have those like slap dots on it, you know, that people have to tear open and end up wrecking the whole thing. Right. Um, you know, I I, w- I would really prioritize the efficiency you know, of, of the production process and the costs and also the user experience of, you know, not having to like tear open, peel things, you know, to get yep. in it. You really just want it to come right out of the mailbox and into their hands. And, and grab it, right. And, and we want it to feel a little bit hefty so it doesn't feel like a, maybe like a cheap flyer that we all just kind of throw in the recycling. Yeah. Um, so it is this thing, there's a bit of an experience. You get it in the mail, it looks like a catalog. It's got, um, it's got a, a, a great picture on the front, I, I assume, a, a maybe a juicy headline. And are are we putting an offer right on the front cover? Yeah, generally, what um, what I've found is that it's good to try to highlight even maybe like two or three different offers with like a page number, you know, you know, and 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 that could be something around, you know, usually it's like what's your best selling item, you know, if you have an established program, you know, and sometimes if. Like I worked with a client last year that didn't have a program. And so we sort of had to guess, <laughs> you know, we, we, and we guessed, you know, smart guess, you know, based off of data that we had and other, other offers that work, but we highlighted that. And then, you know, if there's something new that's going on, you know, we might highlight that as well. Um, or, you know, sometimes there's gifts that, you know, if depending on who your audience is, if it's a, you know, these are great gifts for your church you know, on page seven are great gifts for your, you know, whatever organization, you know, I think about your audience. I'd say, you know, I'm kind of leave that a bit of a wild card, but we'll highlight two or three things on the cover, you know, with specific page numbers to draw them in. Right. Maybe something that is new um, or, or, or in the time of COVID, I, I, I saw a bunch of catalogs that had like COVID specific gifts on the cover. Yes. Yes. And, and that's, you know, and that was definitely something that, you know, I would say last year is, you know, it, I think it, you know, if you didn't do it, you would appear tone deaf. Um, this year, what I've seen just in the landscape is like people are starting to talk about that. They're talking a lot about COVID fatigue. It's like it's, you know, it, it's something that you don't want to completely walk away from, but you also don't want to, you know, devote your entire catalog to something like that as well. Yeah, for sure. So we're going to assume that people are going to kind of hang on to these for a little bit, right? Hopefully it's going to live in the home. Um, mm-hmm. Our hope is that it stays on a coffee table uh, or on yep. a kitchen table or whatever. Um, it, we're going to drive them to to an online gift catalog and we're going to get into that. But um, <clears throat> the option for people to just send back um, a reply slip or check like like you would maybe in a direct mail appeal. Are we still including that? And if so, are, are we just like if, if the catalog is saddle stitched, are we just sort of slipping the envelope in there? Or how do we do that logistically so it doesn't like all fall out? You know what? Um, it, it can be a bit of a, you know, this is one of those like you get with your production team and brainstorm kind of things. But generally, it's like an envelope with a order form sort of saddle, stat, saddle stitched in there. You know, and and what I found too is like you know with some with some uh, clients, they're able to fit every product that's in the catalog on the order form. If you have you know too many products to do that, it's like pick the top ten and then leave lines for you know open you know open spaces for people to fill it in. Um, but generally, you know, it's it it it's something that I, I'll admit it's like it's fading away, but there's still a segment of people that are going to take that piece of paper and they're going to fill that thing out. Yeah. You know, and so you just want to make it easy for them. And also, also don't forget that those people are older probably that are doing that. So, you know, we've even tried to make sure it's like, is it large enough font? Is it, you know, are the space, are the lines easy to write in and, you know, and wider, um, you know, and, and if that means, you know, you're sacrificing, you know, a few products, you know, and leaving more open spaces, it's like, you're better off to do that than to, you know, try to cram everything in an eight point font. <laughs> Yeah. And even just it, it, even if it's fading away and, and people are, are moving online, the fact that there is a reply envelope in there is just a signal that, hey, a reply is warranted. Right? Like this yes. is something that you should reply to. 
Um, yes. It, it, it's a bit of a, you're kind of creating this expectation and this experience um, for the donor that this is something that needs to be replied to. Um, yes. It's not just a magazine for you to read. Uh, yeah. That that's it, and you know, and even from a tactical standpoint too, it's like when it when it usually you know those are always in the center spread of the catalog. So you know, when you think about it, that's one of your best performing spreads, and it's like it's it, you know, it's not a coincidence that it's it sort of when it sits down there, it naturally opens up to that. Right. <laughs> you know, it's like a natural bookmark <laughs> that, right. that you put in there. Yeah, this is important. This page is important. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Number two, um, the, the second sort of lesson for nonprofits as they're creating a gift catalog is to con conduct sort of a detailed product analysis. And this one might trip a few people up a little bit, especially if, if they don't have a mature program, because in direct mail pack, like we either know if an offer worked or it didn't. Um, mm -hmm. Even if we don't do detailed analysis, we just kind of know either money came in or it didn't. We look at response. We look at average gift. We look at how some segments performed. You know, maybe how many lapsed donors you activated and we compare it to last year. But in the catalog, mm -hmm. you have all these different offers. How do you know what was effective? Um, how can you analyze? Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it's become a little bit harder with online, you know, with the methodology, but the, the tried and true in catalog is actually, it's called a squinch analysis or a square inch analysis. And yeah. that is, you know, on, on the print catalog, it is literally finding out, you know, how much, how many square inches on the page does that product take up? And then you're looking at the revenue brought in by that product. You know, and then to some degree, you're able to make some mathematical decisions and say, you know, and, and really where this comes in is saying, does this product deserve a full page? Does this product, you know, should this product be smaller? Or maybe it's doing really, really well, you know, because you're going to develop an average revenue per inch, you know, in your print catalog, and you'll be able to work and make strategic decisions, um, you know. What the, this does a few things is like one, it it, it takes out the pet projects that you know the uh, let's just say the senior leadership of a nonprofit might really want this product to be a full page ad and gives you some ammo, you know, cause that never happens. Right. You know, <laughs> um, to say actually this mathematically doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. and also too, it's like, I've, I've had some clients who have a lot of editorial content in their catalogs and when they start looking and saying, okay, each inch that you donate to or donate, uh, dedicate to editorial is costing you, you know, a thousand dollars suddenly they start looking at it in a completely different, you know, perspective, you know, and they, they're turning this more into a merchandising tool. Um, gotcha. To flip that to online, you know, it's the same, I would say that's really, you know, just basic good web, web usability. It's like, you know, your product categories, you know, your best products are going to be at the top, you know, the further you get down the page, um, those are going to be the, you know, the ones that are not selling very well. And, you know, frankly, if you have to click the next page, it's often kind of like the, <laughs> if you have to go next on your products, those are the ones that are probably not going to get viewed very often. Okay. So we take our physical catalog, we literally like measure out how many square inches we have on a page. And then we look at, okay, we've got four products on this page, you know, I don't know, 25, 30, 40, 50 inches per, per offer. Um, we look how much money it made and then we figure out, okay, so... Um, we get about four hundred, five hundred, six hundred dollars per square inch on on this, um, and it costs us mm -hmm. eighty, ninety, a hundred to print. And so we look at a bit of an ROI per inch. Is is that what you're suggesting? Like, like it, it's kind of like a brute that, force analysis, exactly like it. that. Okay. It it truly is, it, and and this isn't something I, I want to be clear. It's like this is not my idea. Um, this has been going on for years in the retail sector. Um, I was actually taught by someone who was the um, executive vice president of catalog marketing of Eddie Bauer, you know, a huge retailer here in Seattle. Um, so I trust her, um, you know, and, and how they do yeah. it. But, you know, it, it, what it really does, though, is it takes the guesswork out of it. And it, you know, it, it lets you make a strategic decision and saying, you know, either, you know, this product needs to be bigger, it needs to be smaller, or something's not working. You know, and often when something's not working, it's, you know, the photo, the description, maybe the price point, you know, and you, and you can adjust from there as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, this takes me back right to my teenage years working the grocery store and our manager being like explaining to us how retail works. 
and just like, okay, the ends of the aisles, that's a premium product. So we yep. sell that space for more money and more people walk by here. And we've got the milk at the back because we want them to sort of walk around the whole store. So yep. this is very much, you're kind of taking, you're look, looking at this as like valuable real estate and how can we best use it? Yes. Um, and how can you guide a reader, a donor through the experience? Um, that's exactly it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, I, and I'll say too, it's like, you know, sometimes the client will say, oh, there's this one outlier, like, um, I think about, you know, like there's the retailer Patagonia, you know, their catalogs tend to be very photo heavy and, you know, less product. And it's like, well, you know, you're also looking at a brand that is all about an adventure story. So, you know, don't, don't look at the outliers <laughs> in the catalog world. Yeah. Look at the hardcore retailers who are really, you know, really looking to, to sell merchandise at volume because that's where you want to be taking your cues from. Yeah. Yeah. And Patagonia is a lifestyle brand. They're selling the lifestyle and their yep. products are obviously a premium product. So they, they move less volume at, at a higher price. The, exactly. Um, if we find out the offers, so we do a squidge analysis when we found out, okay, here's like our, our top three or four offers. These are like our best performers. Um, now that we were armed with this information, um, what, what do we do I'm, online? I'm assuming we're going to feature those heavily above the fold. Like that's what people see, but in the, in the gift catalog, in the printed version, are we, are we repeating those on, on the front page and back page? Um, or are we giving them their own space with editorial content? You mentioned a little, little bit of editorial content before. Is that a supporting sort of player in the mix that, that helps push those items or. You know, I, I would say a small amount of editorial. It's like if you have to go too if you have to go too deep into the copy, you know, it's probably you need to work on the offer itself because it's not easy to explain. But in terms of the top two or three, those are really your you know your inside spread. You know, page. You know, it could be something that's on the cover and then you open it up and then it's there again on page two. Um, it might be something that's featured on the back cover as well. Um, you brought up a good point about repeating. Um, it's absolutely okay to repeat, you know, an offer, you know, uh, or, you know, or a product in different, maybe on the back cover or inside back cover, um, you know, and it doesn't have to be the full thing. It can just be like a little mention, you know, maybe something kind of in the quarter, you know, quarter eighth of the page. So if a designer is working through it and they're saying, Hey, I have some space here. I'm not really sure what to do. It's like, we'll go back to your top two or three products, you know, and maybe just give a little reminder right there you know, right. in that space. And you can just say, you know, remember this product, go back to page two, right? you know, kind of thing and be taken them back to the full description. Yeah. Are we using those products? I'm, I'm, we're going to support the Christmas catalog with, with some emails, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course, let's say we've got, I don't know, 20, 30 offers. We may not dedicate one email for each offer. So are we taking those top performing products and, and building a bit of an email strategy around those as well? Absolutely. You can have so much fun with it in email um, because, you know, generally you will have that hero product, you know, wh where I kind of tell clients to say, you know, and start out is like, they'll probably feature five products in an email. They'll have, you know, their main product as the top, and then they'll have, you know, two, you know, you know, two more products and two underneath, you know, that are kind of like small little like sub products. And you can really start to learn and kind of mix those things up. Or depending on what kind of organization you are, you know, if you have products that, you know, you could that, like to give an example, you can say gifts for mom, gifts for dad, gifts for teachers, you know, whatever those might be. And you can kind of take that template and, you know, and productize it and come up with products that might make sense that, you know, on their own might not, you know, the theme might not go together. But, you know, when you start, when you establish a theme and you establish the audience, these products make sense for yeah. those types of people. I want to talk about, uh, on, on the coattail of that, I want to talk about bundling gifts a little bit, um, mm. because this is just something that, that we've started playing around with. So for Homeless Mission, for example, we create a Hope Pack, which is just a bunch of best-selling items. It's a backpack, yep. it's socks, it's hygiene items, toothpaste, toothbrush. Uh, it all gets put together into Hope Pack Bundle, which is um, which kicks off Giving Tuesday. Um, and it's part of the catalog, but that's the Giving Tuesday offer. Um, have you seen those perform well? Have you have you seen that play out across the board? Is that a good idea, or or is that one of those like uh, you kind of got to test and see if it works? You know, it, it's I, I I always see it as like you, you need to test your combinations of what works, but it's very very low risk, and it it you really only have an upside to gain from it. 
um, you know, what, what I've found too over the years is that, you know, there, there's a large portion of shoppers that go in with a, a price point mindset, you know, and they're trying to, and they're trying to match up. And so, you know, rather than downgrade them, if you kind of bundle some gifts together, of products that might make sense, um, you know, you're able to just upgrade their giving. Uh, and, you know, in some cases, you know, I've, I've known organizations that the bundled gifts have actually outperformed, you know, there's, the, it's replaced the hero offer, yeah, you know, right. if, if you will, um, yeah. because they put together good bundles that make sense. Yeah. Just, just as a test last year, we tried, we tried one offer, which was like buy the entire catalog with one, with one click basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was a bit of a steep price and, um, everyone was a little bit apprehensive about it. Like it, it, it feels a little bit like really we're going to ask a donor to, to thousands of dollars with one click. Um, but there was, I think it was two or three donors who ended up just doing that. Um, yep. which, which was, again, it's a very low risk test. Um, at the end of the day, you have 10, 15 K that you didn't have before. Um, just exactly. adding one offer, right. One, one button. Well, and, and, you know, uh, I think we were talking about this before we started the recording, but it's, you know, it's like, it's a don't, don't ask, don't get mentality. Um, you know, if you, if you don't put that opportunity out there, you know, for these big gifts, um, yeah. you're not going to get them. Uh, yeah. So, you know, look at that product strategy and say, you know, okay, well, you know, most of our product price points are lower. How do we get up that average gift? It's like, well, you know, you can group together five, you know, $100 products. And now you have a $500 product with no extra work right. that you had to put together. Have you seen upsells at checkout work like they might in in the commercial space? Um, you know, last year I saw this play out a bunch. I, I don't know how successful they were. One of our clients had a very successful ten dollar upsell, which was to provide PPE for people in the field. But but is that a is that a successful strategy, or does that decrease response? Or um, I've only seen success with it, to be honest, and it, especially and I would say around the like you know, like the 10 to, you know, $15 ish price points, you know, it is where it is where it really comes to, um, you know, I would say it comes to value. Um, you know, I had a client about four years ago that when I, we were starting to do a product analysis, um, they, there was this one product that was just, you know, above the fold in terms of performance and I couldn't find it anywhere in the catalog. And it turned out, well, the web developer just had this idea to add in a $10 provided pair of shoes offer in the checkout. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it was like number eight out of all the products. So if that tells you something, um, you know, it, 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 I will say sometimes there's technology limitations, you know, on that with the platform. But yeah. if, 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 you're, if your platform has it or if you're looking at changing a platform, you know, it's definitely something that's worth looking at adding in. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, f- great. Like if we have a catalog. We're going to do a squinch analysis. We're going to see what worked. We're going to test some of those things like bundling offers, making themes for emails, um, trying maybe an upsell at checkout. But if we've never had a catalog before, we're doing this for the first time. Um, you mentioned before that that we're taking some guesses as to the offers. Uh, should we just look back at all of our campaigns over the last few years and just be like, which were the ones that worked really well? Is, is that a good starting point for an offer just to know what, you know, these might be the best performers or, or, or is that not a reliable gauge? <laughs> It can be a good it can be a good starting point, you know. Um, but I would say look at your campaigns for your mass, and then also, you know, this gives you an opportunity to look at like, you know, if if you have staff who is working with mid or major donors, also surveying them and finding out what their interests are too. Um, and then another kind of funny place that you you know that people forget to look about is like, okay, look at what you're funding, you know, sort of like out of you're, you're funding out of directly out of your budget. You know, what's the, what are these offers that you're um, either you didn't think it was fundraisable, you know, and so you, you, or it was too scary to try to do a major campaign around, or sometimes um, campaigns or things that might be too small to do a major campaign for you're like, Oh, you know, we're saying, you know, if you're a multi-million dollar organization, you're like, well, we only need to raise $30,000 for this. You know, a large organization like a world vision is like, well, we're not going to do a direct mail appeal, yeah. but Hey, suddenly that becomes a nice little catalog offer, you know, that you yep. can drop in and test and try to. Right. Um, and, and, and I would say if you're, if you're just starting out, um, you know, it, it really is like a, you know, a more is more strategy, you know, don't, you know, don't be afraid to keep coming up with ideas. 
uh, because the more products you add are just the more opportunities that you're going to have for success. Okay. All right. Lesson number three is uh, we're getting into digital and this is all about um, optimizing. Um, now, this this is where it might get tricky for some nonprofits who, who just maybe don't have digital um, know-how or, or resources inside, uh, you know, in-house. Uh, they might buy a platform or they might pay for a platform or their donation page platform has a catalog option. So they go with that. Um, but let's start with this. Generally speaking, as a benchmark, how many online gifts should we expect from a print catalog? Just to just to give this some weight on how important it is. Is it 40%, 50%, 60%? What, what are we looking at, generally speaking? If you're not doing at least 50% of your revenue online, you have serious problems. <laughs> to be honest, it's, you know, you have a poor online experience. Um, you know, generally clients now are 65% or higher. Um, it's not uncommon to see 80% uh, being online revenue, you know, and, and sometimes that has to do a little bit with your, your, your donor demographic. You know, if you have an older one, you might be skewing a little bit lower. Um, but, you know, it, it really is one of those things where it should be the lion's share of your revenue coming in that way. Coming online. Yeah. So if somebody's listening and their gift catalog is performing what they think is an adequate way and, and it's less than 50%, you can do a lot better by improving yeah. your digital experience. Um, you can. And, and that should be welcome news to you. <laughs> yes. It, it means you're leaving money on the table, but there's a lot more that you can go and, and get. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And, and I would also argue too that um, there are... It, you know, there are technology platforms available now to nonprofits like never before, you know, from a cost standpoint, um, you know, and, and we're not going to get into like payment integrations and, you know, accounting reconciliations for this, but <laughs> just to say, you know, it's like you could go out with a Shopify car, uh, store or a Squarespace site yeah. and build a catalog now for you know a few hundred dollars that would have cost you several thousand a few yeah. years ago yeah um you know it might not be ideal from a from an accounting standpoint but it's possible uh for you to do it now yeah you can ask for forgiveness later when you've when you've raised thousands and thousands of dollars but they all have to be entered manually by somebody on the back end <laughs> yeah i i'm i'll admit i'm not um you know i i'm I, I'm not very sympathetic when they say we have all these gifts to enter. It's like, okay, well, you know, but uh, I'll also say this to all the development people out there. It's like, well, then go buy them pizza and sit with them and help them do it. Yeah, <laughs> Little side tip, uh, you know, you'll earn, it'll help you earn forgiveness faster uh, when you break the rules. Yep. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. So we're going to optimize the online experience. What are we optimizing for? Are we optimizing for sort of like items in the cart? Uh, are we optimizing for conversion, net revenue, um, all of those things? Like what are some, some key things we want to look at? You know, key things are, you know, it, it's the clear navigational categories. You know, does it make sense? You know, when someone comes from a print catalog, are they able to, you know, do the categories of products make sense up top? Um, is it searchable? you know, by keywords, because, you know, don't people often, if they'll find a search bar, just let them get to the products easier. And then really you're looking at, you know, is it, is it one of those things where you're actually browsing and seeing multiple products at a time, you're able to, you know, you're able to get a little bit of that, like sort of like the vignette of like, you know, I'll use world vision. It's like the, you know, the, the goat, you know, buy a goat for someone in need, learn more. You click on learn more, it opens up on this product page that where you can really explain the story of why buying a goat is so important, right? Um, but then, you know, also there's these cross-selling opportunities underneath that goat that are saying, and by the way, you know, try this, add this, add this, add this. Um, you know, most platforms are able to do that now. Um, you also don't want a platform where it's like, as soon as you add a product, it acts like a donation form and it tries to take you right through the donation experience. Right? right. You know, it's like, it's, it's so funny because, you know, as fundraisers, we think get that gift, get them through the funnel as quick as possible. And it's like, Nope, I want you to add to cart, add to cart, add to cart. Now I want you to go through the conversion funnel and I want you to feel like you can do that at your own pace. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we actually want to add a bit of friction in the process. I mean, this, this think of Amazon, you're buying stuff immediately. It says, oh, you might also be interested in this. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 
Yep. And, you know, and other things, you know, when you look at optimization, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, this gets into the real tricky kind of nuts and bolts is like, okay, if someone is truly buying gifts for people, you know, are they sending them an e-card or is there some sort of fulfillment piece? You know, we don't have right. time to talk about this, but sometimes you are literally sending something tangible. Yep. Um, you know, how does that e-commerce experience happen uh, where, you know, you can send multiple products or gift cards to multiple people? Okay. Um, you know, and technology exists to make that happen. Uh, but yeah. you know, let the let the donor know how it can happen as well. How many items per transaction or or per sort of customer visit to the site should we be aiming for? Like two, three, four. Um, what's it, what is there a benchmark here? The the range is I, I've generally seen between like it's like one point seven to two point six. You know, and ideally I would say anything over two. You know, is what you, what you really want to strive for. If you're under two, it probably means that there's something that you can be doing, you know, to help cross sell different products. Um, and and there that could be that it could be the platform you're using. It could just be price points. It could be like that add on that we talked about. You know, yeah. a little bit of cart add on gift. You know, at the end there. Um, but you know, generally over two is what you really want to strive for. So if you are under two. And you are providing them with cross-selling opportunities. So they do see other items as they're shopping for one item. Um, is that a price point thing? We're going to, okay, well, maybe just introduce like lower offers. Like if they, if they buy something for 40, introduce a $10, $15, $20 offer as an add-on. It could be, yeah. It, it, price point generally is like a, is a large driver, you know, in this type of thing. Um, also too, is if you're struggling for price points, um, one thing you can do, we talked about bundling, but there's also the opposite. There's the share of, right? right. So you have this thousand dollar product that's super cool, but you could say, well, buy, contribute a share of that for $50, you know, or $25. So you can go the other way as well. Um, you know, and you know, that, that I found, you know, could be a, a really successful driver because you'll, you'll, you know, you'll find someone you know, average cart value is anywhere from around, usually around 150 to about $300, you know, anywhere in between of the organization. So if you think if someone buys, you know, one product for $50, they're probably going to buy two more products for 25, you know, or something kind of make that math work for them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The share of idea is, is really powerful, right? Um, like, yeah, I, I really want to provide that really rugged four by four, like mobile clinic that will go to a small village somewhere, but I don't have the $80,000 to do that. For exactly. Um, but for 50 bucks, I can still feel like I contributed to that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, well, well, this is, this has been very helpful. I have one last question for you be, before we let you go. And that is the, um, the fulfillment piece um of a physical sort of a thank you card if we're buying the gift for somebody else so i'm gonna i'm gonna honor my mom and i'm instead of giving get, giving her a christmas gift i'm gonna buy her some goats and then she's gonna get a card is that how it works um or do i buy a gift card off the catalog and i tell my mom go on the catalog and buy something that you would like how does that work so um I generally prefer, you know, in a best case scenario, it's like where you always give the donor the ability to mail some sort of representational card to the recipient. Um, sometimes people will choose to mail it to themselves and give it to someone, but you know, you want to give the option to actually send it directly. Um, but you do want to offer digital fulfillment as well. Um, the other thing that we've done too, or I've, I've had clients, you know, this is an easy digital thing to do is like offer something that someone can can download and print off the website, you know, and to some degree, it might even be a link in the thank you where it's, it's not gated in any way, you know, because let's, let's hope that if, you know, the son bought some, you know, didn't buy something, he's not going to download the, <laughs> the representational card, <laughs> you know, and give it to them. But you know, you're just provide you're providing something for someone who says, Oh my gosh, I need something last minute. I'm going to see them tomorrow. You know, yeah. I want to give this to them, but I don't want to send it to them an email. How am I going to do this? You know, so right. it's, you know, it's really print fulfillment, digital email fulfillment, and then some sort of like digital self-fulfillment, you know, that you divide it up into. Um, but, you know, what I say too is when people say, ah, oh, do people really use, you know, these, these printed out cards? You know, that sounds like a hassle. We're not going to do it. It's like, well, um, you know, we have, you know, the major retailer here, Target, you know, or Walmart, 
there's a reason when you go through the checkout that they have 25 different gift card designs for you to physically buy that piece of plastic and give it to someone. So, you know, we're still we're very much a digital age, but there's still something about that tangible piece that you can hand someone uh, yeah. that's still relevant right now. Right. Well, Brian, thank you so much for uh, for talking to us about gift catalogs. And um, I-, I learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners learned a lot. Um, before we let you go, we ask every guest on this show, do you have a, a piece of encouragement, a uh, word of advice uh, to all the nonprofit leaders uh, and, and marketers and fundraisers out there who, who are doing the, the hard work of, of building good in our communities day in and day out? You know, I would, I would just encourage that. Um, I would encourage them, you know, especially if you're on the nonprofit, you know, you're on the development side working, working for an organization, strive for excellence, but don't strive for perfection. Because you'll burn yourself out, and I've seen that over my 20 years in this, you know, in this career, um, you know, and think about it from a standpoint of, uh, you know, what it's going to take you to get perfection is actually too expensive. So, you know, strive for excellence, strive for your best, but you know, at some point, it's better to just keep moving forward, you know, keep making forward progress, you know, testing and learning, um, and knowing that you did your best, and that's okay. I like that. Yeah, it's like that saying, "Don't let so don't let perfect be the the enemy of good." Um, yep. It's uh it's so easy to want to get it right before you ship it, right? Um, mm-hmm. But but the important part is to um, to get it out there, get donor feedback, um, do the best you can. Um, really appreciate this, Brian. If people want to know more, if they want to follow you, where can they find you? Um, you can search for Brian Tucker on LinkedIn, or you can go to my website at brianwtucker.com you know, and send me a message. All right. Well, thanks again for your generosity of spirit. And uh, hopefully you can come back on the show sometime and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll nerd out about something else. I'd love to. Thank you. All right. How was that? <laughs>